Um, this is a short version of a long talk that I usually give. Um, and I can't remember what slides I've taken out and what slides I've left in, so I'll, I'll just have to wing it a little bit. While I'm talking, I'm going to pass around some um, herbs that are especially associated with good dreams and sleep and rest. This one is mugwort, which you can find all around the place uh, in kind of rough little patches of wildness in places like Hastings and Eastbourne all the time. So you can smell that and become familiar with that and you might be able to find some for your own use. And you can make a tea out of mugwort or you can just have some of it next to your bed and that can improve your dreams. Um, and the other is lavender, which you probably all know, but hopefully while these pa are passed around you'll be able to get uh, nice and relaxed. So. Go, my okay, so my talk is about lucid dreaming. Has anyone here ever had a lucid dream before and know what I'm talking about? I'm not sure. sure. <laughs> well, so I give this, this long talk about lucid dreaming, but um, the kind of basis of it is uh, to do with ancient Greek sleep temples because dreaming and sleep was used as uh, therapeutic treatment in the ancient world. And this is a photograph taken from ancient Greece of an Asclepian sleep temple. So here you can see some people being attended to in the um, Asclepian. And on the wall you can see these limbs and I think they might be two boobs and a kneecap. And these are what are called the Iamata and they are uh, tokens uh, dedicated to the god Asclepius who is represented here in this chryselephantine statue with a snake wrapped around the staff and a dog sleeping at his feet. And these were dedicated to the god Asclepius to thank him for healing them in a dream. So, oh, you can't see what it's called. I run a little lecture club in Hastings and St. Helens called the Explorers Club. And I got him to give him talks about lucid dreaming because I met a lecturer there called David Luke. I started this club because there were two reasons really. I thought I wanted to go to university, so I uh, started to bunk into the University of Sussex and pretend to be a student and I went to some lectures. <laughs> they were quite boring and um, I lost interest and I thought I don't really want to do anything specific. I thought initially that I was quite like to do anthropology, but I bunked into some lectures and they were well boring. And then I looked at the kind of list of things that you'd have to do to do anthropology and I thought I want to be able to pick and choose what I learn about because I've got a lot of varied interests. So I then saw, I think, Professor Anil Seth, who's at the University of Sussex and he is uh, one of the directors of the Sackler Centre for Consciousness Science there. Um, I saw him giving a talk upstairs at a pub a bit like this and so I said to him, if I give you a hundred quid will you come and give a talk at my house and I'll get all my mates to give me a fiver and I'll do my own university in St Leonard's which is a quite, was quite unsuspecting at the time. Um, so that's what I did and then I ended up having loads of people, really high up amazing professors, doctors, all sorts of people coming to do like a uh, big Q&A talk in St Leonard's and they loved it because the people in the audience were actually interested and they got pissed quite often as well. So, um, so the Explorers Club worked out to be brilliant. This is Dr. Dirk Engelbert, who's one of my favourite, pictured here without his bum bag, which he normally wears all the time. And he is a, a psychotherapist, but he developed a hypnagogic light machine that he uses in his therapeutic practice. Uh, and one of my other favourite lecturers is uh, Dr. David Luke. I don't know if any of you have heard of him. But I started uh, doing talks about lucid dreaming and getting into it because I had lucid dreams all the time when I was little. And I got talking to this lecturer, David Luke, about lucid dreaming and he told me he was doing a lucid dreaming study. And I didn't know that you could go to university and do subjects like lucid dreaming. And then had I known that, I might have gone. Um, so uh, David Luke got me interested in it and he told me about ancient Greek sleep temples and he told me that there was actually an ancient Roman sleep temple in Gloucestershire at Lytton Park. So I got this bloke to take me there on a Tinder date and he happened to be an archaeologist so it had like some... When we got there it was actually closed but because we'd driven all the way from London they let us in because he was also an archaeologist. And so that was my first contact with the, the sleep temples of the ancient world. So what is a lucid dream? For those of you who've never experienced it, it's a dream where you're totally aware of the fact that you're dreaming and you can change it, um, but mostly that you are conscious of the fact that you're dreaming. Has anyone had a dream like that? Yes. Yeah? 
Good, okay. So, in sort of scientific terms, it's when your, your frontal cortex is activated in, in a normal sleep, in a normal dream it wouldn't be. Um, so you're able to be aware of what you're doing and often you are quite, uh, you're in quite a blissful state when you have a lucid dream. You get this rush of bliss and joy because you're fully present in the dream state and it can be really exciting. So there are a few people that are associated with um, making lucid dreaming something that people recognise. And Keith Hearn is a scientist that was working at the University of uh, Hull and he developed this little gadget here which was the dream machine and it worked by sending electrical signals into the wrist to kind of alert a sleeping person to the fact that they were asleep but very kind of subtle and sly and then it worked on this principle of ocular signalling so before the person had gone to sleep they agreed upon giving because um, your eyes are the only things that can move during a sleep state they agreed upon um, to have your eye move into this certain pattern. So they would say something like, your eyes move like six times to the left, six times to the right. And they agreed upon this pattern before the person fell asleep. And an experienced lucid dreamer was able to remember this in a dream state and do the correct signaling. And during this REM phase, they are all hooked up to EEG, so they were able to to show that they were also properly in an REM state. Um, Stephen LaBerge is the kind of American equivalent, and he's kind of like the kind of Hollywood version of lucid dreaming scientific research. And he runs a uh, lucid dreaming retreat every year in Hawaii that sounds amazing. And he invented a little machine to help people lucid dream called the Nova Dreamer. And it's an eye mask that has an inbuilt REM detector and red light uh, kind of electronics within it so that when it registers that you've gone into REM sleep it starts triggering this red light that starts flashing so you probably have dreams about fairgrounds or police cars chasing or something like that but <laughs> that red light gets incorporated into your dream and the idea is that it's just enough to let you know that you're dreaming but not enough to totally wake you up. Uh, Stan Krippner, he is more in the kind of um, psychology and myth of dreams and he studies dreams and dream culture all around the world and he's got this, he wrote this amazing book with David Feinstein called Personal Myth and it's all about um, working out what your personal mythology is and using symbols and motifs that you see in your dreams to, to become more aware when they pop up in a dream. So for example I dream a lot about things like lions, massive lionesses and so I did a, a workshop with Stanley where he took you through dreams and different waking experiences and made you kind of see where the thread, if you like, the sort of thread and the symbols and the myths go through your reality into sleep. So um, working out what your personal myth is and what your personal like, dream language is really can help you become lucid in a dream because if you know that you always um, dream about a certain thing, it can help you become aware of the fact that you're dreaming when you see those things appear in a dream. So how can dreams help you? Um, dreams, I think, can help you in lots of ways, and mostly, for me, they are this creative, joyful expression. And one of the reasons I got into studying lucid dreaming again was because I'd always been able to do it since I was a kid, but when I had my daughter, obviously I had a lot less sleep and I was suffering from sleep deprivation, but I think more than anything else, I really suffered from dream, like lack of dreaming. I didn't have as much REM sleep and my dreams had always given me this like, massive sense of joy and happiness and creative expression. And suddenly I wasn't having that in my life and I felt quite flat and miserable. Um, and when I'd identified the fact that the reason why I felt miserable was because I hadn't been having any good dreams, I made a real effort to um, have more of them. So they can help you a lot with imagination and creativity. One of the, my two kind of big things as a kid about uh, why I thought lucid dreaming was so important was one of the things I really wanted to do was make a machine that could show my dreams to other people like a film. And there was actually a, an experiment done in Japan. I don't know if any of you saw this. It was really amazing. It was these scientists showed um, subjects hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of hours of YouTube footage and had their brains all wired up to not necessarily EGs, but like quite, quite complex and sophisticated brain activity monitoring devices. 
and they showed them lots of different kinds of things like talking heads, scenery, particular objects. And then when they dreamed, they were hooked up to the same technology and they were able to identify based upon what parts of the brain were active, what kind of thing they were looking at. And they kind of tried to give a representation of the sort of thing that ha was happening in their dreams. And if you look it up on YouTube, it's really eerie and weird watching it because when people are dreaming about a talking head, as you often would do, like seeing a face, you see these weird, like blurry news figures talking at you because it comes from the YouTube footage that people have seen. So the other reason why I was really into lucid dreaming was when I was a kid was I thought that if I could master dreaming and stay conscious, because that's essentially what it is, you're conscious in your dream, um, I would be able to like not die and be conscious and go through death and see what happened on the other side of death. And that was one of my big things when I was little. Uh, transcendental experiences. You can have experiences in dreams, like you can when you take psychedelic drugs, that are not limited by the bad, you know, the normal boundaries that we experience in reality, and they can have quite profound effects on on you and be quite life changing. Um, I've never taken any psychedelic drugs, but um, I've met a lot of people that have come to the club have talked about psychedelic science and talked about psychedelic sub substances. And they all said to me that if you can lucid dream, they wouldn't bother taking any psychedelic drugs. And I think that there's something quite healthy about exploring these realms uh, through the dream state um, in comparison with taking psychedelic drugs, because sometimes you can have bad experiences, you can be in an environment and you don't necessarily have control of what's happening to you in a bodily sense. So I think dreams can be very valuable for this sort of thing. Healing. Um, healing is something that the ancient Greeks thought could occur within the dream state and I think that there are various aspects of lucid dreaming and ancient Greek sleep jumping practice that make me think healing was possible in those situations. Uh, dreaming was hugely important to ancient people. And I think we kind of underestimate our dreams these days. We're kind of distracted by a lot of other things in culture and in media. And we don't pay that much attention to our dreams. But they were massively important to ancient people. And I, I personally think that dreams were probably one of the first things that were ever recorded in art and in uh, literature. Julian James, this American psychologist, wrote this book, The Origin of Consciousness and the Breakdown of the Bicameral Mind. And he says that he thinks he believes ancient people had uh, a kind of a different state of consciousness to that which we have now, whereby the dream state and the waking state weren't enormously different. And that the, the ego identity, the inner voice, we didn't really experience as being our own. We, we detected um, this kind of direction as coming from something outside of ourselves. I think that language and writing plays a really important role in dreaming actually and I, I recently went on a Vipassana meditation retreat and it, it kind of made me realise how important it is to write dreams down because when you think you've remembered to dream, often you haven't really and you need to write it down and there's something that happens in the process of writing a dream down whereby you commit it to your conscious memory in a way that it doesn't ever really get committed to your conscious memory otherwise. So in the process of writing down a dream, you have to remember it and revision it as you're writing it down. So I think that can, that can help a lot in uh, confirming what you've experienced. So the earliest languages were things like the Egyptian pictographic hieroglyphs, like very early symbolic representations of things, and they've become increasingly abstract. But dreams were recorded. This is a piece of a, a dream book that was handed down generation after generation in one Egyptian family. And uh, one thing I really love about ancient Egyptian dream interpretation is they thought that puns were important and there was a lot of emphasis on things like wordplay. And one of the things you get from writing your dreams down is you realise that there are clues and there are things in dreams that unless you actually write them down, you don't get the meaning because the visual representation of the thing isn't the thing, it's, it's something to do with the letters or the, the word itself. So in Egypt, they thought about puns in dreams and things like this, like sometimes a visual representation will mean the word rather than the actual thing. And then they had good and bad uh, omens in dreams as well. 
And you kind of think in ancient cultures, they didn't often have a very uh, broad experience of the world, and, you know, and they only saw uh, within quite a narrow kind of range of things. So cross-culturally, there are different meanings to different things, and there are culturally specific dreams as well. I think the next slide is, yeah, in ancient Egypt, a really common dream was your face turning into a leopard. But they also, there's reports of um, teeth falling out a lot in ancient Egyptian dreams as well, and things like that. So, um, the ancient Greek technique for healing patients when they visited one of these ancient Greek sleep temples was called dream incubation. And this happened in this sacred space called the Abaton, and you'd be invited to sleep or rest on the sacred skin, which was traditionally the skin of a sacrificed black ram. And this comes from an even more ancient tradition of incubating dreams directly on the earth, like lying and connecting with the earth to receive dreams from the earth. <coughs> this is a bunch of Etruscans relaxing on their couches. And this is, I think this is a relief from Asclepius, an Asclepian in, um, which one is it? Epidaurus, one of the biggest Asclepians in the Greek world. And this shows a patient reclining on what's called, what was called the clinae, which is where we get the word clinic from. And this is the sacrificed black ram pelt laid on a, a stone table. And this process of dream incubation is kind of how these healing dreams would work. And essentially, these people are experiencing guided hypnosis. They would be kind of lulled into sleep and suggested to as they were drifting off to sleep. When you fall asleep every night, you go through this phase of hypnagogia, which is where you start to see interesting visuals, you might even hear something, um, but you start to hallucinate basically. And one of the techniques of uh, lucid dreaming is that you try to maintain your consciousness as you're going through hypnagogia, and you can go straight from a wake, wake state into a lucid dream. Um, but that's, and I think that's essentially what they're doing in the, in the sleep temples. So the, the aim of visiting a sleep temple was that you would receive a healing dream from the god Asclepius himself. And there are lots of accounts of Asclepius coming to people in dreams and healing him, them directly. And the thought was that the touch of the god Asclepius, or one of his animal attendants, the dog or the snake, the snake was seen as the theriomorphic form, the animal form of the god Asclepius. And if you were touched in a dream by the snake, or by a dog, or touched by Asclepius himself, he would be healed directly. And lots of the accounts of the healing dreams that the patients had would be things like Asclepius performing impossible operations on them, like um, chopping their head off, tipping the bees out from that skull, and then sewing it back on and things like that, and they'd wake up completely healed the next day. So when a patient would lie on the clinae, they would be guided, they would go through a sort of guided hypnosis and they would have these ideas planted in their, their unconscious mind to make these manifestations of Asclepius or the snakes or the dogs appear. And in Asclepians, they, had, um, they always had lots of snakes in them. There will be snakes slithering around the temple all the time. So you can imagine the snakes are quite a primal, symbolic figure for human beings. And I think if you were in this room now and there are hundreds of snakes slithering all over the floor, there'd be quite a good chance that your dream, you'd have a snake in your dream tonight. <laughs> so hypnagogia is that state that you go through as you're drifting off to sleep. Hypnopompic is the state that you kind of rouse out of sleep. And a myoclonic jerk is that thing where you're falling asleep you like that, you know, when you fall down a curve. <laughs> And this is a famous painting representing uh, hypnopompic imagery by Salvador Dali. And it is interesting. Does anyone know what, what I'm talking about with the hypnagogia and the hypnopompic, that thing where you start to see these visuals, and if you concentrate on anything too, too strongly, you just wake yourself up out of it. So if you want to um, work with it to get into the dream state, you have to kind of look at it in a certain way, a kind of soft focus. It's a, I always compare it to looking at a, um, you know, those magic eye pictures, those magic eye books they used to have. You have to kind of look through it rather than uh, as if it's a flat surface to see the image. One of the nice things you could do in Asclepians was 
but you go and have a dream for a friend. If your friend was too ill, you could go and dream on their behalf, and even that would be able to cure your friend. And one of the nice little things about the Asclepians, it's said in some books that in order to visit a dream temple, a sleep temple, you first of all had to be invited by the god. So the god had to come to you at some point in a normal dream at home and say you were allowed to go to the sleep temple. So the sleep temple, here is a representation of the temple to Asclepius at Epidaurus. And this was a hugely elaborate, beautiful building. And Epidaurus was one of the most celebrated Asclepians because Epidaurus was believed to be the birthplace of Asclepius. So here you can see um, an image of the snakes on either side of the door. It's a huge facade. And here, as I think that's on the other side, there was this, um, there was this ginormous uh, Chryselephantine statue. The Chryselephantine statue is made out of ivory and gold, and they were like the most expensive, lavish sculptures and statues that anyone could ever build. And you had to massage them every day to stop them from drying out and cracking. But this one was sat on top of a well, so it was moistened a little bit by the water. So Asclepius the healer, it's thought that um, Asclepius actually inspired the Jesus story and the early Christian um, founders tried to destroy the Asclepius myth as much as possible because he, he had lots and lots of followers at that time. And he was the son of Apollo, who was also a healer god, but a god of music. And he, Apollo um, had a baby with Coronus, who was a mortal woman. And Coronus cheated on Apollo, and Apollo was really angry, so he killed her. But when she was burning on the funeral pyre, he felt guilty, so he slit her womb open, rescued the baby Asclepius, and gave the infant Asclepius to the centaur Chiron, who was also a healer god. And um, Chiron taught Asclepius the arts of healing. But there was this uh, magical, supernatural experience with a snake in the woods that um, really made Asclepius one of the greatest healers, he was even able to bring dead people back to life. And for this, he was punished. I think Zeus killed him, and then Apollo was so angry um, that he got tried to get his revenge back on Zeus, and eventually Zeus um, made Asclepius the Ophicus uh, constellation in the sky. So Asclepius <laughs> is often featured with Telesphorus, who is this little cherub and I think he quite nicely represents the ancient Greek philosophy towards healing and medicine because he means, Telesphorus translates as something like um, uh, bringer to perfection and it's this idea in ancient Greek uh, healing whereby health and well-being is to do with harmony and Harmony is kind of represented in all the ancient Greek arts, in ancient Greek music, in ancient Greek um, architecture, and in their ways of dealing with human health as well. So these healing sanctuaries, there were loads of them all over the ancient Greek world, and they went on for more than a couple of thousand years. They were obviously successful in some way, shape or form. This is the ruins of the Asclepian on the southern slopes of the Acropolis in Athens. And there's a, there's a spring here that still has worshippers to this day that is kind of sealed off from everybody else, but people still uh, make pilgrimages and leave dedications there. And the sleeping, the sleep sanctuaries were usually made up of a few different sacred buildings that served specific ritual functions. The Abaton was the place where you would go to have the healing dream, and this was believed to be the domain of the god. This was the place that the god could visit you. Uh, the Tholos was a circular building uh, where worship, especially in the form of lyre music and singing, was conducted. And I think I've got a picture of the Tholos. And the Dream Tunnel was um, a special installation at one of the biggest Sclepians in Turkey called Pergamon. Where it's this huge long tunnel that you have to walk through in order to reach the Sleep Temple itself. And apparently, as you're walking along it, there's a little stream that trickles, and the idea is that this the sound of this trickling stream gets you in this kind of hypnotic state, and these tiny holes and recesses in the walls would be where the temple attendants would whisper suggestions to you as you was walking through. So yeah, I've got like a, a picture here. The Tholos is this circular building, 
And contemporary art geoacoustic uh, work shows that actually this building, the way these buildings were designed was to amplify the quite quiet lyre music and the choral music. So it had a kind of multi-function. In this place, the, the choruses, song and music was really, really important in these sleeping temples and it's because um, ancient Greeks really thought that harmony and um, the power of song and music and the arts could have a, a healing effect on the human body. So this, this tholos in Epidaurus was uh, one of the most expensive and lavish buildings ever made in the ancient Greek world. And um, uh, modern uh, archaeologists now think that it served this purpose of amplifying the very quiet lyre music. It has these uh, brass amplification pops that were found inside it and this particular layout that meant that you would be able to hear this music all over the temple, all over the sanctuary. Um, Yes, there's another image of it. So in the ancient Greek world, and in a lot of the ancient cultures as well, um, they believed that dreams fell into a couple of different categories. There was one that might require um, a dream interpreter to pick out clues of your dreams and then tell you what it meant. The divine dreams were the ones where you had um, direct contact with God, and they were the ones everybody was after, and they didn't require interpretation. And then other ones might just be rehashing of day-to-day -day events. Ancient Egyptians believed that uh, dreams offered you this access to the dead and the other world. And um, they had a quite interesting dream idea as well. They, they had sleep temples that were associated with Imhotep, who was the uh, pharaoh's um, uh, pharaoh to... Uh, in the ancient Greek world, he was the, sort of thought to be the designer of the stepped pyramid and a physician and a kind of real person that became deified later on. But um, Asclepius took over from him. So I think dreams can work in this healing sense because when we see, when we have uh, good experiences in dreams where we might receive a healing or something great happens to us, it just makes us feel good and we can see in action and um, things happening that we feel that things that we can be made better in this instance. To give you an example, the guy that I run uh, dream retreats with, he was a child actor and was in Grange Hill and things like this. And he, he did uh, acting for years and he told me that one time he spent uh, six hours with his throat slit on a mirror in one of his roles and he kept playing these like sick and ill kids. And when he was 18 he got cancer and he knew, he really felt that it was because he had played sick and ill people for such a long time that he had eventually become ill himself and he decided that he was never ever going to do um, acting ever again. And when he was uh, receiving treatment, became incredibly ill, he was in a coma he had a dream where he was shrunk down and became a, a, a Ghostbuster character and killed the cancer in his body. And when he woke up, he felt so positive and that this had really happened. And he knew he was going to get better. And he did. And he's become like extremely passionate about like, how powerful dreams can be in this way. So the Ayamata, as I was saying to you right at the beginning, with these little tokens. So this is a votive thumb. And it's a bit like a Facebook like. So you would leave these little tokens to show, to thank Asclepius, but also to show people who were coming to the sleep temple that the cures had been successful. And I think there was quite a powerful effect that these um, Ayamata had, because if you're in somewhere where there are, you know, it's almost like advertising, hoarding, like everyone saying how brilliant Asclepius is, Asclepius healed me from this, Asclepius killed me from that, would have quite a powerful effect on the people who are visiting the sleep temple that their, success, their visit was going to be successful as well. Here's some ears that were healed by Asclepius. Here's a bum cheek and a leg that was healed by Asclepius. There's lots of symbols within the sleep temple culture that we now still use today as well. The bowl of Hygieia. Hygieia was um, Asclepius' wife and she was represented um, always holding this snake and this bowl 
and it, the symbol represents panacea and poison. Panacea was one of Asclepius' daughters, and um, this symbol is used by pharmacies still around the world, this idea that poison can be medicine. It's quite an interesting one. So the temples were covered in these snakes. They're, they're still called Asclepian snakes, and they're non-venomous snakes, but there would have been a lot of them in these temples, and they were considered sacred animals, and in the ancient world, there were lots of snake cults, and snakes were always associated with regeneration and supernatural healing abilities because, as you know, they, they can regenerate their tails, they shed their skin, they, they do quite a lot of things. You can see why ancient people would revere them in this way. Uh, so this is, the this is a symbol of Asclepius, and it has parallels with all sorts of things, even the serpent in the, in the biblical uh, tree of knowledge, uh, with the Kundalini rising, um, with the caduceus that Hermes carries, there's all you know. There's a lot of things that you can see in this symbol that are repeated throughout different cultures all over the world. So the the idea that the the healing that happened in uh, these sleep temples might be aligned somehow to Kundalini activation, I find quite an interesting one. One of the things that I cut out of this talk was um, the fact that. Some people believe these sites were built on geomagnetic hotspots and that um, the Earth's magnetic force field was more powerful in these times, it's less than half as powerful now, and that we may have actually been able to harness the Earth energy um, in a more tangible way in these days. Um, but Kundalini activation, one, has anyone watched uh, Wild Wild Country on Netflix? It's a really brilliant documentary about a cult. But a lot of it um, is about experiencing states of bliss and joy and uh, devotion to, in those kind of cultures, a guru figure, basically. And Kundalini activation, there's this really interesting um, kind of aspect of Kundalini activation called Shakti Pat transmission. And that happens when uh, someone visits their guru and they can apparently be instantly healed by the touch of their guru. And so I think that in these dream states where you experience this, this bliss and this joy, there's something in that state in itself that can be quite healing and powerful. And you can have these sorts of experiences during near-death experiences and out-of-body experiences as well. So our, the archetypal system, if you look at the work of Stanley Krippner and David Feinstein, plays quite an important part of interpreting your own dreams and using your dreams as a tool for self-development as well. Uh, the tarot deck is a really good representation of the archetypal system. Watching weird symbolic movies, this is a, a shot out of Holy Mountain. Um, if you watch anything that's really richly symbolic, really um, uh, really archetypal, like these, these figures in a film like Holy Mountain, they just kind of really trigger these kind of deep, unconscious responses. This is one of my favourites. Has anyone seen Zardos? You must have seen Zardos too. It's amazing. I have really good dreams if you watch this. So working out your personal mythology is a little bit like um, making your own film, I suppose. You work out what the themes are in your life. And sometimes you find that you dream about something over and over again. And when you resolve it, you won't have that dream anymore. I, I think I used this book as my kind of dream um, dictionary in a way. When I was a kid I was absolutely obsessed with this book so my dreams often contain lots of different animals and there's all kinds of like myths and stories and symbolism around the animals that I dream about. Uh, another thing... Sarah, yes. you've run over so we just oh, need okay. to... Yeah, okay, so I can't remember how many I've got left. So shadow work is something where you confront your, um, <laughs> your kind of worst shadowy elements of yourself which I discovered mine was a bit wrong. And this is an interesting diagram that shows you your circadian rhythms. And your circadian rhythms are basically your kind of body clock. And I think a huge problem with modern people is that they don't sleep enough. And that circadian rhythms were disrupt disrupted by uh, artificial light mostly. So as I was saying before, you can use dreams as death practice. And uh, ancient people believed that entering a dream state was quite similar to the kind of state that you would enter once you died. This is an Orphic gold tablet. It does talk about the goddess Mnemosyne, um, 
And so you can use the state of dreaming to prepare yourself for uh, death ultimately. Okay, I'm just going to pass this. So, yeah, I, I believe that we dream ourselves into being full beings. And I can remember one of the first dreams I ever had. Um, I got a phone call on this phone, and it was Wurzel Gummidge, and he told me that my, he had just killed my nan. And uh, from that point, I remember my dream environment getting slowly more and more filled in. And these are my tips for lucid dreaming. So you can write a journal, and journaling really helps with uh, remembering uh, your dreams. And I think reading novels is a really powerful way to encourage lucid dreaming as well, because um, there was these studies about um, the effect on the brain of reading novels, and basically because you're kind of imaginatively living out what you read in a book, um, that kind of changes the neural pathways in your, in your brain for a few weeks afterwards. And um, yeah, there's all these little tips here. You can ask me questions about these things. But I also have some uh, sleep temple oil here that's made, inspired by uh, dream spells from the Greek magical papyri. And uh, there are lots of things that can help you uh, improve your dream recall and your memory. And I think any, any foods or any um, vitamins or any activities that improve your memory are likely to have a good effect on dreams and dream recall and lucid dreaming in particular. Okay, that's it. There we go. <laughs> If anybody has any questions before we take a break, uh, then far away. But there is, uh, we, we're going to have a, a temperature minute right okay, here, great. and then we'll, we'll be in to, to Ted. So, does anybody have any questions for Sarah before Marion? Yeah. Thank you. Why is it that certain things are quite realistic and other things aren't? So, you might have a situation where it's a house that you lived in, but it's got a swimming pool in the middle of it. So, why is it that some things are, are, are like? Yeah, well, I think that's thrown in with something that's, that's never quite accurate. That section that I kind of flipped through was about that, and that's kind of this idea that I think uh, the dream landscape is almost like a psychic landscape, and you create this architecture of the soul. So, um, a swimming pool may have a sort of symbolic representation within you, the landscape of your personality, for example. So. You often see, if you actually observe the dream environment as you're dreaming it, you recognise there are these kind of hybrids of places from your childhood. Like one of the things I've seen is that I was brought up in Croydon, which is extremely boring, but I have these dreams of a kind of exotic version of Croydon where it's elements, but they're like tropical exotic versions of stuff like the crappy shopping centre or Bellington Park, but they're like jungle versions of them. And if you write that down and you take out the sort of basic elements, you can see what these things mean, and that can be really useful for like working out um, what you're dreaming about and why you're dreaming it. Tropical Freud, I love it. Um, <laughs> any any final questions before we? Yes, John. Um, back in the the uh, early nineties, um, Richard James, the Aphex twin, was mentioned first. Or claimed that he was creating uh, all his music through lucid dreaming. Oh yeah, I knew he was really into lucid dreaming, yeah. Are you uh, aware of anybody else claiming or perhaps managing to harness this for their own uh, creativity? Yeah, there's quite a lot of um, dream-inspired musicians, like uh, classical musicians, authors, um, inventors. I know Thomas Edison used to go to sleep holding ball bearings and um, he would kind of enjoy that creative th experience you'd have during hypnagogia. So when he'd finally drift off to sleep, the ball bearings would drop and he'd wake up suddenly and he'd be able to remember what he'd just dreamt about. I can't think of what specific musicians wrote what in a dream, but I th it's quite a common thing that people um, come up with song ideas or creative ideas or film ideas um, in a dream state. Excellent, thank you. Um, any final questions for Sarah before we take a break? Uh, oh, yeah, no? Sorry, yeah? Sorry, I'm greedy. Um, <laughs> uh, do, do you think as well, sometimes when people now have gadgets, they, yeah. they fall asleep with, which they say the worst thing to do is it, to have, fall asleep when you've got some sort of tablet or a. Mm. Um, well, they're all, you know, all devices like that emit blue light. Interfering with dreams. Yeah. Would, 
because because they emit blue light, but also mentally they're a distraction. Because I think a lot of people set alarms on their phone now to wake up. So as soon as they wake up, they look at their phone, and then whatever they've just dreamt about goes straight out the window. But with devices in particular, they emit blue light, and we have um, uh, the pineal gland in our brain is sensitive to blue light, and uh, because it's we should be falling asleep according to the phases of light and dark as the earth turns on its axis. Because we're being disrupted and our brain's tricked into thinking it's um, light, we don't get enough sleep because our circadian rhythm's all disrupted. I think you can put uh, like a filter on your phone and, and also just not have a phone anywhere near your bedroom and things like this as well. But yeah, you're all welcome to ask me questions in the break. Excellent. Well, we will, but I'm, I'm just uh, conscious of time, yeah. that's okay. So can we thank Sarah? Uh, for